Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Steve Watson. I am a lecturer at Hartford University in the Agricultural Sciences. And today we're going to be having a panel discussion about agriculture and climate change and trying to decide who's responsible for what. Um, we know there's been a lot of messaging to the public, especially about the meat sector. I've cut out some, some headlines there. There's been some science about it. Um, there was a point which I felt like The Guardian was running an article based on Poor and Nemechek 2018 about every week. Um, so there's been quite a lot of that go going out to the public. I do think some of the messaging is changing ever so slightly. Uh, there's some, some new science emerging about perhaps um, the land use benefits of livestock, um, livestock benefits to communities. Um, some of the nutrition um, work out there is, 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 is promoting a, a healthier sort of livestock message. Um, and so this is basically what we're going to be discussing today. So um, with me is a panel, and I'm going to get them to introduce themselves, uh, tell you a little bit about themselves, and uh, then we can move on to, to the discussion points for the afternoon. Okay. Can, can you hear me now? Good. My name is John Gilliland. I'm a farmer from Northern Ireland. I am here today as an advisor to AHDB. Um, my, my particular interest is in climate smart farming. Uh, for seven years, I chaired DEFRA's Rural Climate Change Forum. And for the last three years, I've chaired a farmer-led innovation program called Arc Zero, taking seven farms on a journey to net zero in Northern Ireland. Afternoon and hello. I'm Kate Bannister from the NFU. I work on net zero with our climate change team. Uh, my remit is really to try and translate our 2040 net zero ambition into action on the ground working with members, with stakeholders, and of course with policy. Thanks. Afternoon, Becky Wilson from Farm Carbon Toolkit. So we're involved in empowering farmers to understand what greenhouse gas emissions means for you as a farmer practically. We have been uh, provided by farmers for farmers, so set up very much with that farmer-led aim. Uh, and we do a range of activities, including a Farm Net Zero project, is aiming at looking at how farmers can become part of that solution. We do a soil carbon project which looks at how soil carbon is an integral part of the, the benefits from livestock and how that can provide some of those positive solutions. And we try and gather data and evidence from what's happening out on farm to empower farmers to understand how they're part of the solution. Uh, hi there, my name is Anthony Ellis. I'm, in a, whoa, hello. <laughs> I'm breaking the chair. Um, I'm an agronomist uh, in Cornwall um, and uh, four years ago I, I came home and started working on the farm with my father and um, we're a mixed sheep and arable farm uh, and we're also part of the Farm Net Zero project working working with Becky as a monitor farm to try and understand um, our carbon uh, footprint better. Good afternoon, um, Ed Rhodes. I'm a tenant farmer from the Killerton National Trust Estate in Devon. Uh, we organic produce beef, sheep and veg that we grow and supply primarily to Riverford. Um, I did ask why I'd been asked to be on this panel, and I was assured that it was so I could put over the view of a hairy-ass farmer. Um, I'd rather just not go into the audition process. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so hopefully on the screen you can see uh, the discussion points for today, so we'll kick off um, with the first one. Um, so, if I put it to the panel then, um, what role do you think that agriculture plays uh, for causing and solving uh, climate change? And I'll just go, uh, go this in this direction. So, if John, if you want to start us off. Um, as, as far as I'm concerned, we as farmers are the solution, but we also are part of the problem. And to find out exactly where we are, we actually need to know our numbers. And my, m for the last six, eight years, I've been focusing in giving each farmer evidence what their numbers are so they can make better quality decisions. At the end of the day, net zero is not about zero emissions. Net zero is when we bring our emissions down, we bring up our carbon stocks, we use some renewables, and we use some waste management technologies. And when you net all of that, that is net zero. And so part of my frustration is actually we don't have enough evidence to keep articulating this. And we need to articulate this, because at the moment, the media believe that net zero is zero emissions, which it's not. Hi, well, I take the um, sort of NFU point of view um, with our ambition that, of course, um, net zero is about reducing our emissions down as far as we possibly can and then counterbalancing residual emissions 
um, with locking up carbon in our trees, hedgerows and soils. So we certainly have that dual role, almost unique role as being a source as well as a sink. Um, but in, obviously we uh, account for about 11% of UK emissions and as the Climate um, Change Committee report said this week, um, we need to be doing more uh, as other uh, sectors decarbonise possibly faster than us, that proportion is only going to rise. So it's how do we go far further and faster, we need a lot more policy behind us for that. But they also mentioned that it's something we mentioned in our ambition, that we need really, really widespread uptake. We're looking at about 80 to 85% uptake of farmers and growers doing a lot on the farm to really make a dent in the um, inventory emissions. At the moment, that figure is apparently about 58%. So while, of course, we've got a very engaged audience here, lots and lots of farmers we know are doing a huge amount, but how do we then reach that other sort of 30 to 40% of people who perhaps we can influence? We need that message out there. We need that uptake um, at the highest point we can as soon as possible to tell our story. So I think it's a really interesting point because we are one of those unique industries, as John has already said, that yes, we generate greenhouse gas emissions, but we also have the potential to deliver those solutions. And whereas it might be very complicated when we think about agriculture, because other, unlike other industries where they're quite simplistic, where we're just talking about the burning of fossil fuels in terms of carbon dioxide emissions, agriculture is complicated. Because we're not just dealing with carbon, we're dealing with this unique combination of three gases. And that can sometimes mean that it is a really difficult conversation. We're not talking about these simplistic things, like we were saying, as, as Kate was just mentioning, in terms of those targets. But with that complexity comes the flexibility and the excitement in terms of the fact that we can deliver those solutions. And within our gift as farmers, we do have the opportunities to both reduce our emissions with the associated resilience and economic benefits that come alongside that and to deliver that solution. We just have to have the metrics, as John said, and the, the will to actually look at that from a biological position and understand the differences within these emissions in terms of the fact that not all emissions are created equal. And so we need to deliver and develop sensitive, sensitive metrics to be able to make that difference. Um, I, I guess for me, um, there's nobody in this room is gonna doesn't recognise the fact that um, agriculture is pretty unique and that we can we can draw down atmospheric carbon and lock it away back in the soil where it belongs, whilst at the same time producing food, which is pretty important. Um, so what we what we're not so good at, I think, is is um, is telling the positive side of our story, um, and we, we as farmers have access to one of, if not the best, tool to facilitate carbon drawdown anywhere in the world, um, and that's ruminant livestock. And at the moment, the story and the narrative around ruminant livestock is that they're, they're the problem, and they're not. They are a massive part of the solution, and we need to be able to gather the data and, and gather the metrics and, and get that story out there. And so that's the unique position of, of agriculture, is that, is that the tools are in, it, in, in our toolbox, and we, we, we know how to use them. No other industry can do it. So let's tell our story. Yeah, I think the frustration to me is that everything that we hear is the word emissions. And as has been said, we are the one industry which can actually lock up and sequester carbon. And a lot is said about putting it into the soil, and that tends to be the primary method of being able to store carbon long term. And certainly with ruminants, ruminants we need to be promoting the benefit and their ability to do it. But we also sequester carbon in so many other ways. Um, yesterday I was broadcasting to, or spreading muck on some ground that we're planting into veg tomorrow. I'll hold my hand up. I ploughed it first, sorry. Uh, we are organic. Um, we were shearing our sheep three weeks ago. I prefer to call it harvesting carbon. I was sitting in the tractor getting bored a few weeks ago, probably organising the shearing at the time, and I thought, well, I wonder how many sheep there are in this country. And Google told me 33 million. Our sheep at home will produce a bit over two kilos of fleece per sheep. Half of that's carbon. If I turned around and went to Dragon's Den and said I can sequester 33,000 tonnes of carbon every year with virtually no fossil fuel use at all, Deborah Meaden would throw a vegan hat out the wall and put all the money straight up. We don't promote this sort of thing. We don't say as an industry what we're doing, which is good. And I think that's something which, as a whole industry, we're getting to grips with it, but we need to promote it. 
and we need to stop these little quips from radio presenters. We need to try and reduce the impact of the articles in The Guardian. We need to stop the storylines going out in soap operas that makes everybody think that ruminants are killing the planet when we've got, what did somebody say the other day? One, one and a half million people flying up there at this moment in time, and yet my animals are killing the planet. We need to change that narrative. Okay, good. So I feel like we can move on to point two now. So we want to have a little bit of a chat about what the main differences are between how we measure uh, greenhouse gas emissions and what the implications are for agriculture, because they have almost unique implications for, for agriculture, I, I think. And again, we'll just go along the panel, I think. So I'm going to go first, John. When it comes to measurement, for the last 15 years, a lot of public money has been spent in one side of the measurements, which is measuring greenhouse gases. Um, when we started on this journey, when the United Nations started in 1990, they, they created uh, a, a, um, a life cycle assessment calculators that use factors, and they, they started a tier one, so it's an international average. So a cow in Mumbai is the same as a cow in Buenos Aires as a cow in Cornwall, which it isn't. So, you know, back 12 years ago, DEFRA funded to smarten that, but they funded to smarten the greenhouse gas emissions here uh, uh, um, in the UK. So we now got tier two for um, emissions. But what we've got really poor science around is quantifying what our soils, trees, and hedges are doing. And so one of the things we've been doing is focusing in that area to get it to tier two with the hope to get both of them to tier three so that actually when a farmer, and you know, where I come from, we're predominantly livestock production, our Achilles heels were addicted to a monoculture of perennial ryegrass and we love synthetic nitrogen. So the big job we have is how do we wean ourselves off synthetic nitrogen and go to legumes and uh, go a more regenerative route. But as we do that, we lay carbon down in different parts of our soil. Are we measuring it? No. Should we be measuring it? Yes. And what we have found in our farms that measuring to 30 centimeters is not good enough. You know, and we've used one particular company that's really helped us. On my own farm, our average de soil depth is 83 centimeters. We're measuring right down and we're seeing different plants laying carbon in different areas. If we really want to go on a journey of integrity and have our carbon sequestration recognized, that is the level of sophistication we now need to bring on farm and actually measure. As we do this change, in my case, from perennial ryegrass to multi-species growth or herbal lays, or I introduce silver pasture in, I can watch the change in my soil, measure it, and then be used to have it calculated and used in the greenhouse gas inventory. The big problem at the moment, the greenhouse gas inventory is not smart enough to pick that up. So part of our journey is we need government to go with us. And there's two key things on this measurements that we need to get. One is that the greenhouse gas inventory has to get smarter to allow individual behavioral change to be recognized. It doesn't at the moment. And the second thing, all our produce then goes to an integrator or a processor, and they have a scope three declaration. It's an emissions reduction declaration. It's not a net carbon declaration. And again, we need to get that changed. If we're serious about empowering us as farmers to maximize our, our, our opportunity of net zero, because I see net zero as an opportunity, not an Achilles heel, unshackle us and actually allow us to have the tools and second of all, make sure policy recognizes when we bring the evidence to say we have changed our behavior, now change the national inventory, change the scope three emission declarations to scope three net carbon declaration. I'll leave a lot of the measurement in terms of tools to Becky. Um, but from our point of view, yeah, measuring is absolutely essential. Setting that baseline, which takes probably years, but using it as a decision support tool. I know there's a lot of confusion in the industry at the moment, but as long as you're tracking and setting yourself ambitions, what you can do, then you can look at that progress over time. And I was just interested to see in the question that we've got about GWP 100 and GWP star, which is really contentious and it seems to bubble up every so often. Um, we do recognize at the NFU that GWP star is a more accurate reflection of warming. Um, and we do um, advocate for dual accounting. Really, it's the same sort of 
um, premise that anything that puts attention on those hot spots and helps farmers um, look at where their emissions are coming from and making, making those changes is a good thing. But we do see DWP style as being a double-edged sword. You know, the wrong policy levers could lead to perhaps chasing very short-term cooling, um, maybe to buy some time for harder to, to decarbonise industry. Um, that will put us in obviously a really awful situation for livestock farmers, but also to, if we take the focus off carbon dioxide in any way, we're just storing up a heap of trouble for future generations. So I think to add to, to what's been said already, if we just zoom down a minute and look at, I think you know, John's given us a great example of what this looks like at a national and international in terms of how those emissions factors come down and, and the different tiers. Now, even, I think there's a couple of things that need to happen. I think one, we need to be talking about this stuff in a language that engages us. Even for saddos like me that talk about this stuff all day, every day, it's confusing. And what, we need, what happens is that actually with that complexity, with that confusion, people switch off. And actually, as farmers, we need to be able to understand what this sort of stuff means so that we can challenge the policy, as John says. We can start to create that movement from the bottom up. So absolutely, it is complicated, it's biological, all these sort of things, which we know because as farmers, that's what we're managing day to day. We need to create a way where we can understand what's happening with the policy, with the change in metrics, what's happening with government targets, so that we can understand what that means for us. If we then think about you know, metrics and how they work at a farm level, we've also got this real sort of, m sort of issue with the fact that a lot of the footprinting that has been done, any of you guys who might have been through that footprinting process, it's been driven from a top down through the supply chain because they've needed it, as John has already said, as part of that supply, you know, scope three emissions. And the, the methodology that's used for that has been looking at it from your emissions intensity per kilogram of output, per liter of milk, per whatever. And the problem exists with that terminology is the fact that yes, we've got a lovely system that you can certify and all that, but all the great stuff that John's been talking about, about what we do at a farm level in terms of how much carbon we store on the farm, all the great things that Anthony's doing and, and, and that we're doing on our farm aren't included. So we end up with just this emissions intensity which misses a huge amount of the positive stuff which is what drives the, what drives the headlines and drives some of this misunderstanding. So there's a fundamental change that's required in terms of when we want to get to net zero. At the moment, the metrics that are used throughout the supply chain are never going to get us there because we're not measuring the right things. And that's before we even start thinking about, are we using GWP 100 or GWP star and are we looking at global cha temperature change and all that sort of stuff. So there's that sort of fundamental level in terms of as farmers, we need to be measuring at the right scale we then need to think about actually what methodology are we using so that, as Kate says, we don't do what we do in the next 20 years but actually cause massive problems moving forward where we suddenly go, oh, well, actually, that was the wrong way to measure it, but now we've suddenly got no farmers left. So, so we really need to try and do all these things together, and I think a lot of what needs to happen is we need to stop talking about this in this massive technical language that actually switches everybody off and really start to, to in get these conversations happening in a way which allows us all to feel part of it. I mean, we've, we're really lucky in that we've been working with Becky in the FCT for, for a few years now to try and understand our carbon footprint better. Um, as a livestock farmer with, a, with an expanding flock of sheep, I'm perfectly comfortable to work with GWP Star. I don't see it as a double-edged sword at all. I, I see it as the best available metric that we have. Um, I just want... I just want the most accurate way of measuring ruminant, ruminant impact that, that we can get, warming impact. Um, so happy for, for GWP star to be used as long as policymakers understand that by chasing livestock agriculture, by reducing livestock numbers, they're, they're buying time at best. And, and in five, ten years' time, they're going to be right back where they started, um, minus the livestock industry and minus all the positive environmental impacts that come with properly managed livestock because you know th this is a this is a carbon discussion granted but the, the the story around ruminant livestock is is a much bigger story and there's so many more positives that can come from appropriately managed livestock that that you know we, we can't afford to miss the boat on this and, and 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 lose that opportunity for the sake of not understanding the metric properly yeah i think it's it's also about having a baseline 
Um, and I was at the politicians chat earlier on um, in the Big Ten and they were talking there about the idea that we need a baseline for a great range of different things. We need baselines for wildlife that we've got around on the farms. We also need a baseline for the carbon. Um, and it's also perhaps about the funding to be able to do that measurement as well. We've got on our farm core distinctly different soil types um, managed in very different ways. All of those are going to have to be measured separately and really they want measuring last year or 10 years ago rather than in five or ten years' time. We've got to have that baseline, and really everybody needs to have that baseline at the same time. What we've then also got to look at is how is this data that's being collected going to then be used? And one of my concerns is, yeah, it's great. I then know what I'm doing. I can improve on what I'm doing, and I can lock up as much carbon in my soil as possible. But I don't really want anybody else getting their hands on it, because then it's taking the incentive off them to reduce their carbon input. And I understand the principle of net zero, that some people can't reduce it, and others can, um, we're killing the planet, apparently, and yet people want to buy our carbon credits. And the two don't really stack up very clearly to me. Um, so I think we've got to be very careful what this data is used for. It needs to be collected, accurately measured, monitored. But we also need to keep some control of what's then done with that data. OK, thanks very much. <coughs> so we'll move on. Um, so does the panel think that ruminant um, agriculture pr produces significant uh, climate warming in the UK, and what might the implications for that be uh, for policy? I think ruminant agriculture actually is a fundamental tool to help us get to net zero. Yes, we produce methane, but I, um, on my farm, uh, without ruminant agriculture, I would not have the dynamics in the soil I have. We've just finished, we've just had a master's student for four months from Dagenham University in my farm, where we've gone out and measured the soil health metrics. And what we've found on earthworm populations, in soil respiration, in bacterial fungi communities, anything that has big agriculture defecating the soil, the soil health is in far better condition. The key for us at the end of the day, um, and, and, and Becky mentioned earlier on, at the moment, methane is used as a political kicking ball. If you look at the total greenhouse gas debate, methane has been picked on because if we do bring methane down, you can cause a short-time global cooling. And the politicians have decided that is easier than switching off a lot of coal-fired power stations out there. And I think that's wrong that we... Now, there are methanes from fossil fuel um, uh, 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 boreholes and whatever that need to be sorted out, but... We need to be very careful that we don't eliminate uh, livestock production. Methane is the most expensive one. It's the most expensive greenhouse gas to sort out. Improving genetics, improving animal health, uh, age of uh, slaughter, all really important things. But to go to methane inhibitors, yes, there are now some out there that are licensed that work, but there's a real cost. And certainly from AHDB's point of view, uh, to levy pairs, we cannot encourage people to go to expensive mitigation options when you're not getting paid for it. We, you know, quite clearly, when it comes to looking at greenhouse gases and the journey to net zero, we look at CO2 and we'll look at nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide, for me, is the cheapest one to sort out. Um, I notice there is a methane pledge, but it's a pledge, it's not legislation. The legislation is net zero. So allow us to use the most cost-effective tools first in the toolbox to get there. And methane is not it. Um, there are solutions that will come along there, but actually the ones, you know, in the journey we've been on, the big wins we have made is breaking our addiction to synthetic nitrogen and switching to legumes has been our huge win. It's been our huge win in nitrous oxide emissions, but actually we found our animals liked it better. Our live weight gain, we had a 17% improvement in beef. We had a 32% improvement on lamb production just by going there. So we think that's a far better route than actually singling out a single greenhouse gas, uh, which is, at the end of the day, a short-lived gas of 12 years rather than a long-lived gas of 100 years, which nitrous oxide and CO2 are. So I see it as a distraction. Um, yeah, I completely agree that we shouldn't just focus on um, methane. I mean, ag does account for quite a sizable portion of our emissions in this country. But, I mean, it's slightly counterintuitive coming from someone that works in net zero. But just taking greenhouse gas emissions alone is, is too narrow a lens. I mean, we need to work in the full life cycle cost, which is all of the uh, real costs, but also the benefits that surround that. 
I mean, if we were to take, say, the externalities involved in the real cost to the NHS of our poor diets in this country, I'm sure we would value our nutrition much, much better. So for me, it's all about habitats, biodiversity, health and nutrition. It's about locking up that wonderful uh, carbon that we have in our permanent pastures, you know, which really needs to be valued. Um, it's not so simple. Not every single food group is going to be at the bottom of that wonderful footprint chart. So you saw it earlier with Mike Vernon's Lee. You know, you've got the sort of meat, red meat looming above everything else. It's never going to be down with a pea or a cereal. But so instead of sort of significant emissions, can we get down to acceptable emissions? You know, there's always going to be a range of footprints. So what is acceptable and can we get down to that so that we can tell our story and, and have that social mandate to carry on producing? I think it, I think it's an interesting point that you just talked about in terms of I think we need to make sure that when we are doing those comparisons of different food stuffs and food types, we make sure that we are including everything within that and not just cherry picking some of the stats sometimes, which mean that we, we sometimes don't get to the right answer. But I think we also need to be careful that we don't we don't replace one simple question and answer with another one. So I do think there is there is degrees of, of of importance in there in terms of rather than just us saying there isn't a problem, whatever, we need to look at the difference between different production systems. And I think we need to look at exactly as you say, John, we need to, you know, have quite a nice grown up conversation about where we are with nitrous oxide, the import, you know, and actually the, the, the impact of that. We need to look at the different ways that we do produce our ruminant stock because, again, it may well be the case that actually, you know, methane isn't the issue, but we, as Kate says, we might have some of those other things where actually certain production systems are causing other problems. And we need to not shy away from that discussion to work out as we move forward which are those production systems that actually do genuinely deliver those environmental benefits that allow us to get to net zero, that do these sorts of things. And, and I don't think we need to be frightened about having that conversation because by looking at these different things, we can then see where the metrics, because at the moment we've just got these really simplistic things that, that lose all the detail. And I think we need to make sure that we can, we can, we can challenge, challenge the researchers to say where we don't have that information and then work with the network of farms that are running different systems to actually understand what's possible. So I do think we need to be careful, but again, I also think that we are the ones that can offer the solution if we are managing those systems in a way which is you know, using what we've got and trying to deliver some of these environmental outcomes. Yeah, so I, I, I guess there's a, you know, there's a legitimate conversation to have around the, the fossil fuels that we use as an industry, fertilizer, burning diesel, steel, concrete, all the systems and processes that we put around our agricultural um, enterprises that, that we have genuine control over, we can have that conversation and, and, and reduce those um, emissions. What I get really frustrated at is, is the way I, when I, I look at a cow or a sheep standing in a field eating grass and I know that animal does not have one ounce of warming impact on the planet, not at all. It cannot because the carbon it burps out only comes from one place and that's up there through the grass and back into the animal. So um, that's, that, um, that narrative is what, what needs to be changed and how that, that's what we need to get the public and the policymakers to understand that and to leave the livestock themselves alone. And, and when we start hearing things about feed additives and, and trying to change the rumen and try and uh, reduce the amount of methane that the, the animal produces, I get very frustrated with that. Why are we meddling with a biological system that's been evolving for 50 million years quite happily to do a job? Leave it alone. Let's look at the systems and processes around the animal, not the animal itself. Yeah, hard to add too much to that. I think that um, where we're talking about perception and the public perception, I do think there is actually a slight change in the way that things are being uh, reported and measured. It's noticeable to me over the last couple of years, there's a lot more comment now about how much global temperatures have risen since the start of the Industrial Revolution. That's the key to it. It's nothing to do with since animal numbers changed. And in fact, nobody seems to be able to say whether animal numbers have really changed very much or not. Certainly ruminant numbers. Nobody mentions rice production when it comes to methane. As an example, there's lots of other uh, ways in which methane is being emitted. Livestock have just been that easy. Um, you can to kick, or whatever you want to kick. Uh, we have been an easy target, and we continue to be an easy target. And again, that comes back to the narrative that we've got to explain. All of my livestock are grass-fed. If I try to feed methane inhibitors, I've got to completely change the way that I keep my livestock. 
and lose the benefits of having grazing livestock. Um, so, yeah, I agree. I think that we're looking at methane as being too much in isolation in comparison to what is actually causing global warming and climate change. Okay, thanks very much. Um, <coughs> so the final question for the panel then is, how does the supply chain post farm gate uh, contribute to emissions uh, and what can we do about that? So post-farm post gate, um, the way it's currently counted, all uh, processors and integrators have to declare what they call our scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. Scope one is the emissions that they actually create within their processing of, of their material. Scope two is the imported energy that they bring in on site. And scope three is then what happens in the embedded emissions in the raw materials that they bring in to, as such. Um, so, they, uh, uh, so I, I will argue actually in scope one and scope two, most, most processors at least know their numbers, they're reporting their numbers, and actually they have an easier job because they can reach for off-the-shelf technologies and they are renewables and whatever going in. Um, but a lot of them now are focusing on scope three. You'll, any, any meeting I go to with processors and retailers, how do you get to help us get the scope three emissions down? And that's why they keep com coming back to us. Now, my answer to them is we can, we can go on that journey, but only when you allow us to declare scope three net carbon, not scope three emissions, because that's a game changer, because that allows us then to come onto the table as equal partners. And that allows us, I mean, when we did our benchmarking of the seven, and we have measured our carbon stocks forensically, uh, um, with uh, measuring carbon down to a meter deep and using aerial LIDAR 40 scans per square meter. So we're measuring all the carbon in trees and hedges. So we now know our carbon stocks. On, on our f seven farms, we manage 510,000 tons of carbon every year before we produce an ounce of food. Nobody talks about that. On my own farm, I, ma I manage 24,500 tons every year. We've now set our targets. So for me, in five years' time, when we go through the process, I want to be somewhere between 26 and 27,000 tons of carbon. When you approach it in that way, that is a far more appetizing conversation for all of us as land managers, but at least we've got the metrics now at a resolution that has integrity. And my credit to the measuring industry, the teams out there measuring quality carbon down to that kind of depth, and also um, these new aerial LIDAR technologies, 15 to 40 scans per square meter, the knowledge we're getting of our landscapes now, it's time that we now reach those. I come from part of the United Kingdom where the government has stepped in. So we now have a soil nutrient health scheme where all of this has now been benchmarked. The government in Belfast reckoned this is a public good, so they're paying for it. It's 45 million pounds over four years. Why? Because we believe this is the best way to evidence the integrity of what we do as farmers and to give the power back to us as farmers so that we can actually rise to the challenge. Uh, and certainly every time I get doorstepped by concerned citizens about the animals that are on my farm, and you can see their, you know, their, 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 their pensive, their, their, uh, you know, their aggressions in their voice, and I say, well, hold on, just before you slate me, how much carbon do you look after every year? And there's a silence, because they don't know. They've never been asked this question. Well, I said, I understand your pause. Let me tell you how much carbon I look after. I look after 24,500 tons every year before I go to produce any food to sit on your table. I would politely say, you actually need me more than I need you. And it's this kind of a, a, a narrative, you know, earlier on, you know, the, the gentleman at the other end were just, just saying, you know, we need to change the narrative. We need this information. Baselining is fundamental and it needs to be the right things we're measuring so that we can actually take on this narrative and turn it around. And from an AHDB's point of view, that is something we are you know, looking into at the moment about how do we get this base lining done across other regions of the United Kingdom. And there is really good public evidence now that when farmers get baselined, lo and behold, they make better quality decisions. And you know, when you make better quality decisions, it's better for profitability and it's better for the environment. And that's our experience on this journey. Thank you. Yeah, it has indeed baselining has been uh, an NFU ask of policy for some time, and 
Leopard did announce in Green Day that they would be supporting online carbon footprinting. So we're hopefully going to be working with them now to see what that actually looks like and what advice can be given. So that should help. But it certainly is a real concern to our members, um, all the supply chain scope three, because obviously food producers can account for a huge proportion of that scope three. Um, so we recently uh, produced some sector resilience plans um, de designed by members for members. And we're using these to work with the supply chain because even if a food producer says 60, 70% of scope three, they cannot shoulder that responsibility on their own. So we're really using these sector resilience plans at the moment to engage with supply chain and look at back where we can align on policy and indeed support to, to our farmers. I think just following on from what we've said in terms of you know scope one, scope two, and, and a lot of the supply chains that are now starting to realize that a lot of their emissions are coming from that scope three, so they're gonna have to start having a conversation with the farmers that supply them. I think a lot of it, again, goes back to what I was saying earlier about making sure that we've got those, those metrics in place that are really accounting for both where the emissions are coming from, but also where the potential positives are. And this idea, again, we need to move away from just measuring emissions intensity to be able to measure that sort of holistic view of what's happening on the farm. Because again, although they are producing a, a lot of the emissions associated with that supply chain, they're also where the solution lies if we can get those metrics right. So again, they can sort of tech their way out of some of their scope one and scope two, but certainly we've been doing some work with some supply chains where they are starting to think about that much more holistic way and how do, rather than just saying, you must do this and this is what we're gonna set down, how do we have a much more open and empowered conversation to realize that actually where that sits. But I think the other thing we need to be very, very careful of is actually where we have farmers that potentially might be tenants and supplying lots of different, and it goes back to what you said at the beginning, and also what you said around understanding that baseline and then understanding, depending on where your produce is going, what does that look like in terms of who might have an ask over that as part of being able to sort their carbon footprint out and really having that good number to be able to then see what the options might be. Um, I had a good dinner table statistic the other day. I have no idea whether it's true or not. Somebody, somebody might know. Um, the, the carbon footprint of Tesco's fridges and freezers alone is bigger than the whole of UK agriculture. You reckon that's true? Yeah, so I, it feels to me as a farmer, it feels like the supply chain, chain is doing what the supply chain always does and kicking the shit da back downhill to the farmer. And we're being expected to carry the can and solve the problem so that everybody else can kind of carry on as, as normal. Um, and it's, you know, and it's not just the supply chain doing that. Government, it feels like government's doing that. And, then, and they're trying to do it for as little money as possible. Um, the, the budget for Elms is 2.4 billion, that's less than the price of an aircraft carrier apparently, and that's what, is that what British agriculture is worth? So the, the supply chain and government need to start to recognise the value that we provide and, and, and stand by us, basically. Yeah, we have a lot of public engagement on the farm, um, I get doorstepped, my standard response to people is, how much carbon does a cow or a sheep produce in a year? Simple answer, none. Can't, can it? All it can do is recycle it. And that starts getting people thinking a little bit. I'm going to be fairly hard line on what we can do about carbon emissions outside of the farm gate and say that's not my problem. And one of the simplest ways to solve that is I do not give or sell my carbon to them. It's their problem to solve in whatever way they choose. I've heard the figures about Tesco's freezers. Tesco's need to sort that out, not me. It's not coming back on me. I'm very proud not to be supplying Tesco's for a start. Um, but we need to do what we can do on our side of the farm gate. Most of us are already doing that. And if we are giving them a get out of jail free card by selling them, if we do sell it to them, no doubt cheaper than they would be able to solve the problem themselves, we're not actually going to achieve anything. Um, I'm sitting here feeling fairly tired. I grow veg and I'm absolutely knackered after the last six weeks of watering veg that's had 13 mil of rain on it. Um, I'm directly affected now by this climate. And as far as I see it, whether this is climate change, whether it's man-made, but whatever it is, it's happening today. And if anybody in this country, or any, any of us in this country is affected directly by it, it's us. Uh, and I wanna see it sorted, and I wanna see it solved, and I can't do that on my own, and farming can't do it on our own. The ones who can do it for us are the big industries, the ones that have got the power. Um, and 
and why were there something like 500 delegates from the oil industry at COP26? They weren't there to do the planet a lot of good, they were to do their industry some good. Um, how many people from the farming industry were there? Probably not 500, I suspect. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to do everything I can. Our industry is going to do everything we can. But other industry has to do the same thing, not use us as an easy option out. Okay, thanks very much. So at this point, I'm going to open up to questions from the floor. Uh, we have got a roving mic somewhere, so if you'd like to ask a question, um, wait till the mic gets to you, please, if you could. Uh, has anyone got any questions at all? Go on then, chap at the back with the hat. I've seen you, you can go next. Uh, hi, Charlie Steer from Grover Farms. I'm just wondering why Tesco's are worried about our scope for emissions, but we don't have any play on the emissions of inputs to the farm, so um, shouldn't be talking about fertiliser, but it's a good example. Uh, w w you know, we get that on our carbon balance sheet, but you know, w why, why is that even there? We don't manufacture the fertiliser. That's true. Um, does anyone want to take that one on? Um, I, I can have a stab at it. Um, yeah, that is part of your scope three. Obviously, it's just a portion. It's the portion that you have on farm, but it's looking at this full life cycle cost. So we need to look upstream and downstream of every input that we use. It all goes into that, that final product. The, the way the counting system was, was set up in 1990, everything went on the production and manufacturing and nothing went on the consumption. And, you know, there's many of us who've queried that for the last 30 years. Was that actually the right decision? Um, in certainly in agriculture and food production, it actually stuffs agriculture. Now, we're fortunate we're currently uh, in the United Kingdom Agricultural emissions are not the same. You know, if I go to the Republic of Ireland, I don't know if anyone's following what's going on there. 33% of greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture. That doesn't mean a cow in the Republic of Ireland belches out any more than cows over here. It's the way the counting system works. Um, we were fortunate at the moment that we haven't had as much draconian policy that's going on in the, in the Netherlands at the moment over nitrogen de de deposition in the Republic of Ireland, they're now talking about killing 300,000 cows next year, 300,000 cows the following year, and it's just uproar. Now, part of all of that is the accountancy system and the fact that they've siloed it. And uh, so the way the scope uh, emissions are designed, it is up to actually, well, I mean, Tesco's worried because actually it's their integrator or processor who has to make the declaration. Um, but uh, I'm also worried because government needs to look at our businesses being holistic businesses that do good as well as bad. And my real worry about the debate at the moment is that it's ring-fenced up to emissions. Everyone wants to focus on emissions. Um, nobody wants to talk about carbon sequestration. Nobody wants to recognize that on my farm, I use renewables for all the heat. I don't get credited for that. You know, people who've got AD who are reducing, right, they may produce electricity, but they're also reducing methane. Nobody gets credit for that either. So, you know, one of the key things that certainly I know the NFU are looking at, I know AHDB are looking at, is actually how do we get fairness in the reporting system that actually gives us a level playing field? Because I don't believe the, the playing field is level at the moment. Okay, thanks. Uh, anyone else got anything to feed in there? I think just to, just to carry on from that, I think absolutely we need to look at that and have full transparency in terms of allocation and where that goes. The only thing I would say is actually, going back to your point, if we use fertiliser as an example, as we start to see that those fertiliser manufacturers start to you know, look at what they're doing around that scope one and scope two, we will see that actually the carbon footprint of that fertiliser may well be something that actually the supply chains you know, link on to so actually, you know, if you were doing that, you could say, well, actually, you've got fertilizer X that has a carbon footprint of this, and you have fertilizer Y, where actually, as John says, they're starting to use more renewable energy and has a lower carbon footprint. You do need to be able to, if you're going to, pe you know, if you're going to use that lower carbon footprint fertilizer, you need to make sure that as part of that accounting process, you can take account of the fact that you've made that decision. So I think absolutely we need to have a real open and honest discussion about that allocation and where things go and where things stop. But we also need to make sure that 
the result of that is that we don't lose the flexibility that as with feed, with fur, as we start to see the manufacturers use carbon potentially as a, as a marketing opportunity to look at where we're using different things, we still have the flexibility to be able to include that in our footprint if we're making that decision. I was just going to say that um, I think it demonstrates how we are the whipping boy. Can I take you back to roughly this time last year when the oil price was sufficient to shut down fertilizer factories? What was the panic about? We haven't got enough carbon dioxide for all of the different industries that use carbon dioxide, slaughterhouses, beer, drink manufacturers, and all the rest of it. So that carbon dioxide actually gets used somewhere else. Do the drinks industry then have to declare that carbon dioxide that's released every time a bottle's opened? I don't think so. Just demonstrates where we are in the chain, I'm afraid. Okay, thanks. Um, chap at the front, and then, and then I'll, come, I'll come to you. There's a, there's a microphone arriving. I don't know precisely what proportion of Britain's food is actually produced by agriculture, but I'm getting the impression that it is going down, which in the context of A, climate change, and B, increasing world population, that is a very unwise um, thing to do particularly when you consider back in 1940s and before the first uh, during the First World War, this country was almost brought to its knees by U-boat activity, um, reducing the amount of food that was being brought into this country. So that it is a strategically unwise decision to be uh, following policies that reduce the amount of food that we are producing I'm wondering how much you, as uh, representatives of the agriculture industry, are making the government aware of this strategically unwise policy. Okay, thanks. I think John's got thoughts on that, haven't you? <laughs> well, I don't, don't know. If, I mean, success of governments in London have never prioritised food security. What they have prioritised is cheap food. And this government is no, d no, no different. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter what colour it is. Um, we have a short-term memory. I mean, my parents absolutely remember the slogan, Dig for Britain, where absolutely we had to put that. And you know something, I think the Ukraine war and then the weather problems in Spain and Morocco later on in the last 12 months, I think there are certainly some longer-headed people in Whitehall for the first time are now saying, actually, we haven't got resilience in our food supply chain. They, they, I don't think they're going to use the word food security, but resilience. What we do know is we are in a world of considerable turbulence and uncertainty, whether it's strife, whether it's extreme weather events. I think all of us who are involved in both land management and food chain, we need to get our head around how we build resilience. And you know, I take Ed's comment is, you know, the, the, the amount of watering you've had to do because you've been so dry. No sector knows more about the consequences of our changing climate than you and I in this room. We, we, we have to face it. And um, I just, I get really frustrated about this conversation that it's all about emissions and it's not about resilience. And resilience is also security, okay? It's also economic resilience. And you know, I really think we need to move this debate on is how do we get resilience of the food chain to supply society? And I, I, and I just want to add one extra thing, and that is about nutrition of food. You know, I too um, went to listen to Mike Berners-Lee and his, and he absolutely lost me when he said that a soya bean was more nutritionally dense and diverse than ruminant products. Sorry, that's rubbish. It does not have any heme iron, it doesn't have any vitamin B12, it doesn't have any omega-3. You know, um, sorry, we need a balanced diet, and that's a diverse diet, and we, you know, we need a mixture of all of these things. So we need to be honest with ourselves, and one of the things, this debate has been single issued because it has just looked at the carbon intensity per kilo of output. It has not looked at the nutritional density and diversity of the diet 
and the carbon footprint ac across that. And ruminant products, whether they be red meat, whether they be dairy products, have a collection of nutrients you cannot get at the moment. It's really hard if you want to be a, if you want to be a vegan, you need to work hard to give yourself a balanced diet. If you take out, where do you get your heme iron from? Where do you get your vitamin B12? So certainly, you know, from AHDB's point of view, you know, where we're you know interested in going eventually is around a sort of a concept around one health. You know, the f you know the environmental health, the health of our consumers, the financial health of our levy payers. For us, we think ultimately that's the direction of travel we need to be focusing on. Instead of cherry picking, it's net zero today, it's biodiversity tomorrow, it's water quality the following day. We need to bring this round. What we do as farmers is we deliver multiple public goods. And you know, it's about time we find metrics that actually rewarded that. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Um, did, did, was there thoughts on that on this side of the room? Well, uh, all I was gonna say was, um, just to pick up on your point of, 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 of the war, I look, I look at what's happening in Ireland and what's happening in the Netherlands with utter horror. My grandfather bought our farm in 1942, height of the Second World War. He bought a farm knowing that the Germans could evade and take it off him, or if he didn't farm it in a manner which pleased the ministry, they could take it off him. It was a huge risk to, to, to buy that farm at that time, and I just wonder what he would think if he were alive today to see what, what governments are doing to agriculture now and how short-sighted they are in terms of food security. So, yeah. Okay, so I just want to move on because there's quite a lot of questions. There's a chap at the back, I've seen you, and then I'll try, try and get around everybody. Thank you very much. Oh, not switched on? Yes. Um, Andy Guy, I'm an in independent sustainable farming consultant. Um, I've listened with interest and, and thank all of the speakers to the complaint about um, concentrating on emissions. Uh, clearly, you're, you're absolutely right about that because we've got to look at the whole picture. So the other side of the picture is the sequestration. Most of my clients and most of the people in this room have multiple outlets from their farm. They've got beef and sheep and wool and you've got vegetables and there's probably some cereals and so on. It's relatively easy to work out the emissions from each of those enterprises. And if we assume that the models are correct, it's relatively easy to work out the whole farm sequestration. What's really difficult, I think, is how you divide that sequestered carbon and apply it to each of those independent or individual uh, outputs. And I wondered what the panel thinks about how you do that, because your buyers or our buyers are looking for the footprint of the litre of milk or the kilogram of beef uh, rather than your total footprint. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you've hit the nail on the head as to why they've stuck with emissions intensity, because, you know, we might know that actually there's there's an issue with some of the ways that they measure that, but it's simple because you can put it in a nice little box. But actually, when we start thinking about those ecosystem services that we deliver as a farm, you can't put that in a nice little box because it's all integral. And I think what we've seen sometimes when we have that focus on emissions intensity is, is you can almost game the system a little bit and you can say, well, actually, my carbon footprint is this. They want me to get it to this. So actually, if I just move what I do with my young stock that actually gets me to there without actually changing anything. So we need to avoid that. And I think it is really interesting in terms of how we do that allocation. I think, you know, I think there are some things which are quite, can be quite a simple starting point if we think about soils, if we think about actually are there areas of the farm that are in, are in specific crops and actually can we allocate the practices that we do with that crop to actually understand what that's doing. I think it becomes slightly harder when we might think about some of those woody biomasses on the farm in terms of the hedgerows, all of those sorts of things, that then that becomes more challenging. But I think we need to be undaunted by that challenge. And I think we need to go back to you know, where we're actually doing this and start. Because I think the problem sometimes, and, and where we've got into this little bit of a pickle, is the fact that we've tried to do this top-down approach and we've tried to look at it in terms of what the science tells us, whereas in reality, you know, all you guys as farmers are masters at, at managing multiple things at once because that's what your farming system is. So I think we need to use our demonstration networks to actually look at what might these different allocations look like, what are the bits where actually the that crop that we might be producing, it's the management of that crop that is leading to that, to that change in terms of soil carbon. What is it in terms of that diversity of rotation? And, and look at some different models, because otherwise we'll still be saying in the next five years, it's too difficult, therefore. 
we're not going to do anything about it. And we won't have got any further forward and we'll still be having this emissions intensity. So I think we need to just be quite bold and look at what the options are in real commercial farming systems and look at different options to see what works for us at a farm level, what gives us confidence in terms of being able to measure the environmental output of, of our systems, but also start to look at how we can allocate that. Okay, uh, John, John asked to. Uh, well, so just to be bold and audacious, the seven farms that we've gone through, we've done exactly this. So we used a, a whole farm business calculator, first of all. We engaged the soil, you know, the soil and tree carbon sequestration module. We've also backed that up by our baselining, our rigorous baselining of our car carbon assets there. So we've got our net position. So the net position for the business. And then once we got that, we then allocated it back to the enterprise. So our emission intensity per unit of output is um, adjusted once we've got our net position. So we look at our total emissions, our total sequestration, get our net position, and then we factor that back to the enterprises. So our current uh, declarations are adjusted for carbon sequestration. Okay, thanks. I want to try and move it on in this as you guys have so been. If, if I could just do a quick one on that. Um, for me, it would be extremely difficult. The word holistic was used earlier. It's my, as I said earlier, yesterday I'm putting dung from my livestock, my cattle, under the veg fields and then the veg is growing as a result. When I'm having this conversation, particularly with anybody of a vegan disposition who's walking through the farm, what's the most environmentally damaging part of my farm? Probably that veg field. Nitrous oxide emissions coming from that ground, but they don't want to see that necessarily. It is holistic. The benefit, the mitigation to me of growing that veg is firstly there's a lot of veg waste goes back into the ground, that feeds back into the soil, but also it allows me the opportunity to incorporate large amounts of carbon intensive animal dung into that soil. So for me, it will be extremely difficult to try and give an absolute precise answer. I can do it on a farm scale, but an enterprise scale will be very, very difficult. And the whole idea of regenerative farming, to me, I like the old fashioned term mixed farming, and I run a mixed farm. Thank, thanks very much. I think we've got time for about one more. Uh, okay, my, my, uh, my observation as a poultry farmer from just down the road, I produce 1,500 1, tonnes of uh, poultry meat each year. I don't eat a single gram of poultry meat. I can't stand poultry, but I do love pork and I do love beef. And I was a chairman of the NH, uh, NFU Poultry Board for four years. Um, but if I can go back to the question here, which is who is responsible for what, I think as a panel you've really illustrated that we are, as a sector, really conscientious about what our... Uh, uh, our, our obligation is to uh, agriculture and uh, emissions to uh, the environment. Um, uh, but right at the very beginning, we also discussed um, who is responsible for what. And there was a lot of ag aggression, certainly from you, sir, and yourself, about the vegans and uh, castigating individuals who you didn't really agree with. Personally, from, as a farmer who's uh, married to a one vegetarian, one vegan child, they're eating stuff that we produce. I don't care what it is that they eat. Um, and if the stuff in the, you know, the Guardian or the BBC is to your disposition, it is publicity for our industry and it's our opportunity through the NFU, through ourselves, we're in these uh, environments, to engage and not ostracise these individuals. These are our customers. We do a fantastic job. We're in a much better position in our society than most people in our society, certainly with this cost of living crisis and, uh, and the uh, uh, um, access to the great outdoors. We should, we should embrace that and let the negative publicity remain in the headlines of the BBC who are never, and whatever, and we just focus on doing a bloody good job with uh, the likes of the NFU, people in uh, further education, and, um, and uh, just keep, keep quiet. Okay, is there any response to that? Or is that, is that, a, is that a statement? Good, good, good. So, sorry, can I just say one thing? I think you're absolutely right. It's not our job, and sh neither should we ever single out people who have their own eating preferences. I think there's a wider conversation. Is a lot of the a lot of the new swing is to ultra processed food, and I am particularly concerned about ultra processed food and its impact on human health, whether it be animal based or plant based. And I think that we are going into a ticking time bomb, and you know, actually, you know, getting a nutritionally dense and diverse diet. It's one of the reasons why AHDB now have a full time human nutritionist actually looking to help our levy pairs in this area because it is the next time ticking time bomb, human health impacts because of ultra processed food. Uh, to me, sorry, I'm, I'm gonna give an opinion. To, to me, 
that's a marketing tool that the people that are making ultra-processed meat-free meat foods are using. And they, uh, to me, they seem to be trying to conflate the word vegan with somebody that eats this nonsense. Um, and I think that's unfair to vegans, to, to, to be honest with you. I, I think there's plenty of vegans out there who wouldn't touch with a barge pole. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's their marketing that's being taken on. And, and us in, in, in um, the livestock industry, perhaps, are, are, are buying into that and, and, and sort of, you know, tarring vegans with that brush when they might actually be, you know, eating stuff that we produce and not stuff, some gloop that comes out of a factory somewhere. Um, but I'm afraid that's, that's time for us. So uh, thanks to the panel. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, uh, yeah, have a nice rest of the ground. <laughs>